We're in business? Right. Um, hi, folks. Um, welcome this evening. Um, I'm Bruce Hocking. I'm your tour guide for the evening. Where are we? Oh, we're still up there, are we? Good. Um, this evening, we're going to be talking about ribbon synapses and noise-induced hearing loss. And we've got uh, about four main learning aims hope to get across to you during the evening. The first is to be aware of the current epidemiology and criteria of noise-induced hearing loss as per Victoria Work Cover claims. And Kevin's going to give us a brief talk about that, even if to show the deficiencies uh, in that area at present. And then we come on to the main part of the evening, and that's to understand recent advances regarding ribbon synapses in hearing and their importance in noise-induced hearing loss. And associated with that is to be aware of the potential to medically treat patients with early detected noise induced hearing loss, which is sort of over the horizon stuff a bit, but interesting. And then arising from that to consider the potential implications of these advances for noise control, including audiometric testing. Now, as a bit of um, uh, setting the scene for that, there was made available to you the uh, article by Cunningham from the New England Journal. Um, which you should have got on registration, a PowerPoint should have been sent to you so you can uh, bone up as to what's coming for you and uh, also look back with more understanding. Okay, I'd now like to introduce you to Professor Stephen O'Leary. He's Professor of ENT at Melbourne University and he's going to unravel the mystery of ribbon synapses and a whole lot of other things to us. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, yeah, there'll be some fiddling here. Yeah, sorry, mate. And the slideshow. There it is, that's it. Yeah, I'm Yeah, that's fine. Where's the presentation? Okay, well, um, thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk to you tonight. And, um, we're going to be covering a topic that's really just emerging. I mean, it's really not been, wasn't thought of before 2009. The scientific side of it is starting to become understood, but the clinical ramifications really probably have not. So in what I say tonight, there'll be some the facts about what we know about what's being called hidden hearing loss. There'll be my best judgment as a clinician about what that might mean and how it may translate. Um, and then we'll talk about the possibilities for treatment. But why on earth would I be interested in something like that as an ENT surgeon? It's a, probably a good question. Well, I'll talk to you about that because in fact my interest in the potential therapeutic side of this goes back for many, many years. This is where I work, it's the Royal Victorian Idea Hospital, and I'm the William Gibson Chair of Otolaryngology of Foy and Gibson fame, for those of you old enough to remember, Gibsonia underwear, right? And um, Foy Gibson uh, was the uh, relative of the chairman of the board, who was Peter Housen at the time that the chair of otolaryngology was being established at the Royal Victorian Idea Hospital. So the first chairs in ophthalmology and otolaryngology in the country were established there and I'm very pleased to say that they still exist today and I'm the incumbent. So um, with that as a background, it wouldn't surprise you probably to hear that I've been interested in cochlear implants for a little while. Um, so the, but when neurotrophins or nerve growth factors came along, this was something that really interested anyone that was interested in restoring inner ear function or regeneration of the inner ear. And even in cochlear implants, there was thought that perhaps there would be a special place. Now here's a cochlear implant, and I'm not going to spend much time on cochlear implants, so this is the background, right? This is a cochlear implant here, and we're looking at a, an electrode, and there's a whole lot of little neurons there you're trying to stimulate. In a sense, it's about this kind of scale. You've got tiny little neurons and you've got a one whopping great electrode. Now, the problem is to get the fidelity of that cochlear implant better, you actually need to have 
a different type of para uh, paradigm. What you really need is many small electrodes and less neurons being excited by each one of them. And so this is where the neurotrophin story came in for me. And that was that we thought, well, what you could do is you could potentially preserve more neurons with cochlear implant to have a better fidelity. And then you could use those neurotrophins potentially to regenerate the peripheral dendrites and grow them back to your little electrodes, okay? And this is kind of a dream, and the dream has led to experiments where this is what happens in normal hearing. We're looking down on the inner hair cells, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about tonight. The outer hair cells, you can deafen an animal, and then if you give neurotrophins, you get a plethora of new nerves being generated. Now, in fact, we'll, this is all relevant to what we're going to talk about at the end of the talk, believe it or not. It's what neurotrophins do in the ear that's important here. And that's why there is potentially a place for neurotrophins in the treatment of hidden hearing loss, so-called. But anyway, that's the background. That's why I kind of, I've really been watching this space. So you, your work is all about the classic view of noise-induced hearing loss. And, and here we see, again, the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. And after noise exposure, it can look like this. Note that there's a lot more damage to the outer hair cells than the inner hair cells, for example. Um, they've always been more vulnerable. And the question is, well, what does that do to hearing? And then why has the paradigm changed? So I'm going to take advantage of the fact that hearing is my passion to give you a basic physiology lesson of hearing and the inner ear. Because I don't get to do that to audiences like this very much. And I trust you know everything I'm going to say. But you may not. And if you don't, well, you know, that's, that's my big chance. This, of course, is the hearing loss that you live day to day in your practices with the four kilohertz notch that is so classic for hearing loss and why is it around four kilohertz well it's the, probably around four kilohertz for several reasons one the human ear is more sensitive at these frequencies secondly the lower frequencies above uh, below about two kilohertz we've actually got middle ear reflexes uh, muscles that contract that possibly provide some degree of protection, at least to some types of hearing loss. I mean, I think when you're up in the uh, higher levels, probably not the case. Um, and there's also thought to be some non-linearities in the middle ear uh, mechanics that make these frequencies more vulnerable. Anyway, let's talk about hair cells for a minute. Human hearing works by, as you'll be well aware, movement of the basilar membrane. <coughs> the sound enters the inner ear via the stapes, and basically you've got this coil, which is a tuned membrane. And the way it works is that at the base of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is stiff and very thin. And as you go up the cochlea, it gets wider and it is less stiff. And this means that when sounds enter the inner ear, that there will be a resonant frequent place at which they will most likely vibrate the basilar membrane because of this differential stiffness and width, right? So it's like this idea of resonance, that every room has a resonant frequency and, and many, many things like tuning forks have a resonant frequency. And you change that resonance, you change the physical properties, you change the frequency at which that object resonates. Well, the basilar membrane has a shifting physical properties that move the place at which sound will resonate according to frequency. So, for those of you that know much about physics, the inner ear does a Fourier analysis by place on sound. So the high frequency sounds will stimulate the basal part of the cochlea because they will vibrate very stiff 
areas and the low frequency sounds will will stimulate the top of the cochlea but it's not that's not good enough right i mean not for humans at least or mammals you need to have a little bit more to get good acuity so what we have is we have the receptor bit which is the inner hair cell that's the part that actually change uh, receives the motions of the basal membrane and sends that into a neural signal that we'll talk a lot about that because this is the, where the action is for hidden hearing loss but the outer hair cells actually amplify the passive movements of the basal membrane right so they can vibrate up to 5,000 times a second and what that does and so this is another picture of the same kind of thing, but we'll come to this. Um, or actually, before we come to the how it works, one other thing is to talk about the energy requirements for such a system, right? We've talked about hair cells can vibrate 5,000 times a second. So what you need inside the inner ear is a battery. You need to get a lot of energy to these hair cells. And so we have the so-called endocochlear potential. Now the endocochlear potential is created by the fact that there is a middle compartment of the inner ear known as the endolymphatic space, which you might have heard of endolymphatic hydrops perhaps, many ears disease. That's all swelling of this space. And what makes this space special is that the endolymph is high in potassium. It's got a, a potassium uh, concentration of about similar to that of um, intracellular fluid. While, of course, the perilymph that surrounds it is a much lower. It's much more like extracellular fluid. It's high in sodium, but low in potassium. So that sets up a voltage of about 80 to 90 millivolts, as it turns out, across your hair cells. So your hair cells literally have a battery across them. And this battery is required to provide enough energy to jiggle these outer hair cells to refine the movements of your basal membrane and amplify them. So that's becoming increasingly important in age-related hearing loss where we think now when you're getting old, one of the things that happens is that you're basically losing your batteries, aren't you, your cells? I mean, that's the, one of the grand theories about getting old these days. And that essentially one of the batteries that can wear out is, the, is this endocochlear potential that can turn off your hair cells, okay? So um, with bearing all that in mind, this, is the so-called traveling wave I've talked about. And I'm about to tell you what happens with outer hair cells and how they actually augment and refine our hearing. So this is this so-called passive movement of sound traveling up the basal membrane. So this is the base of the cochlea, and this is the top of the cochlea, and this, the movement of the basal membrane comes up and then it breaks like a wave on the beach, right? At the resonant point. Now, this is what it's like as a passive system here. So that's the kind of movement you get out of your passive basal membrane. And someone that's got no outer hair cells, that's the kind of movement of their basal membrane. And what's the consequences of having no outer hair cells? About a 60 decibel hearing loss, okay? But this is what the movement of the basal membrane is like with outer hair cells. And what those outer hair cells do is that they narrow the area of excitation and they give it exquisite sensitivity, right? So you get this huge amplification of the basal membrane, but just at that resonant point. So the outer hair cells are sitting there and when they detect the movement of the basal membrane, they say, everyone on board, and they amplify that. So you get this positive feedback, huge amplification of the basal membrane at that point, and you get this incredible narrowing of the 
region of the basal membrane where this amplification occurs and that gives you your exquisite sensitivity to sound and also it gives you your excellent ability to discriminate between different frequencies because what happens is when your normal person can tell this thing moving from here to here for example and there to there because this peak is narrow your person without a hair out without outer hair cells gets this really wide amplification of sound and they can't tell one frequency from the next okay so that's the classic paradigm of hearing loss and that's the paradigm we've been working at for a very long time so then in 2009 there was a paper published yeah what's that <laughs> oh yes <laughs> right. uh, th there's in, in 2009 um, there was a change in the view of how lesser types of noise exposure might damage the inner ear and this is where this whole question of ribbon synapses come in now what is a ribbon synapse we're looking at an inner hair cell here as you probably know with these hair cells have got stereocilia up here and essentially when you bend them sideways it opens ion channels and that lets in your your, your trans your potassium and calcium and that sets up the release of your neurotransmitter particularly glutamate at the base of the hair cells but what's a ribbon synapse and why do you need it? Well, a ribbon synapse is basically there to increase the speed at which neurons can fire. It's essentially a factory for getting glutamate out and back in to the cell as fast as possible so that you c the cell can transmit very high rates of neural information. And you need it in the eye and you need it in the ear because the temporal change of information is extremely rapid, right? We can detect by the timing intervals between neural responses up to between two and five kilohertz. That's remarkable. I mean, just think about that. The brain is timing information to somewhere between two and five kilohertz, depending on who you want to believe, um, that can, if your brain can basically put that together over an ensemble of neurons and you can actually tell um, changes in uh, in sound that's very fast and to be able to do that you need accurate timing of release of transmitter and you need to be able to get it back into the cell to do it all again particularly if you go to a rock concert or something like that where you're making it work over time so what was discovered was that these synapses between uh, the ribbon synapse, which, which is a presynaptic bit, and then the actual auditory neuron, the peripheral dendrites, this could be damaged with noise levels that were not nearly as great as those required to change threshold. And that was the breakthrough. So what are the main features? Some, one of the other buzzwords in the auditory field is synapto, synaptopathy, which basically just means the synapse is in trouble, okay? So it looks a bit like a neuropathy because what it essentially does is it deafferents the inner hair cells. So the dendrite sitting here, the cells over here, and they're no longer making contact. And the interesting thing in noise is that spontaneously they don't re-establish re contact. Now, in other systems, and including the ear, if you, you can uh, cause an excited toxic injury to the ear by chemicals, and in fact they will resynapse, but in noise they don't. And we don't really understand why that is at this particular point in time. The thresholds are unaffected.
And I'll explain to you why the thresholds are unexpected in a little while, but just take it for red. It means, of course, that conventional audiometry or, uh, or even um, objective measures will not detect this type of injury to the inner ear. What is the most cardinal feature of this uh, from an electrophysiological perspective is that the amplitude growth neural growth with increased intensity is reduced. So what you get is that if this were your conventional amplitude growth of your neural excitation in, in response to increasing intensities of sound, well, if that's normal, then that is going to be what you get for after noise exposure sufficient to cause this so-called hidden hearing loss. It's a reduced amp rate of amplitude growth. And the reason is pretty straightforward. You've got less neurons connected to your inner hair cells. Your inner hair cells are still there, and actually they're working just as well as what they did. Otoacoustic emissions are quite normal. The inner hair cells are not lost, but there's less neurons connected, and therefore amplitude growth is reduced. This occurs at lower sound levels. I won't say, actually, I'll revise this slide. I'll revise the ones later. It, it, it seems to occur in animals at levels that we do think are harmful to people, but at the very lower end of that. We'll review in a minute you, stuff I'm sure that you guys know off the back of your hands, which is what safe levels are thought to be, and we'll compare how loud a sound has to be to cause hidden hearing loss in an animal to those levels. And you'll see that they are still within the range that is thought to be harmful for humans, but it's um, quite a different duration of exposure that's required. Okay. This injury is permanent, and that's the uh, most devastating part of it. Um, and we talked about it being going undetected because you can't detect it on a hearing test. So now we'll show you some of the data from the original paper by Kajala and Lieberman that set the scene. And, and look, these are, we're looking here at otoacoustic emissions, you know about otoacoustic emissions. Basically what otoacoustic emissions are is that when hair cells move, they create um, it's a non-linear process that creates sound, basically. And that sound can be detected by listening or putting a microphone near the eardrum. So the, when the hair cells move, they create actually a little bit of distortion, right? So this, this is distortion products. So you can put a couple of sounds in, get some distortion products produced by the hair cells themselves that actually initiate a traveling wave backwards through the cochlea that then goes back through the ossicles and that nonlinearity and the movements of the basal membrane caused by that can be detected by putting a microphone in the ear. So otoacoustic emissions work by having a sound delivery system in the ear canal and a microphone. And when you have your combinations of tones put into the ear in an appropriate manner, you can actually see whether those hair cells are working normally or not. And ABRs, I'm sure you've all come across, auditory brainstem response, and evoke potential initiated by a transient acoustic stimulus. And so here we have results in a mouse, I'm pretty sure this was, from an unaffected region of the cochlea in response to a two-hour noise burst of about 100 decibels, right? Two hours at 100 decibels. Not that much, really. Not nearly anything compared to the Led Zeppelin concerts that I went to when I was younger, or ACDC. I mean, like, you know, um, I hate to think what it might have happened to the hearing back then. So here we see the different colours here are different times after the noise injury. And this, the green is control, red is one day, and then black is about eight days afterwards. 
And you can see here in this unaffected part of the cochlea, and don't forget that mice hear much higher frequencies than us, so these do sound like high frequencies, but they're kind of human equivalent for our noise trauma areas, right, given the fact it's a small animal. Nothing much is going on here. But what you see here is that in initially the DPOEs, AEs, or the hair cells, therefore, were affected by the noise stimulus in this affected part, but they recover completely by eight days, which basically means that the stereocilia at the top of the hair cells, they, their iron channels get twisted, basically, and they have to, in a sense, unravel themselves, and that takes some time. And when they unravel themselves, they can work properly again. And that's what causes, you know, the, uh, the transient hearing loss, uh, that rather as opposed to permanent hearing loss, that we've all experienced if we've been in noisy situations. But look what happens here to the AVRs. So what we have is increasing levels of loudness and increasing amplitude growth of the neural response this being the neural response to the auditory nerve, the first wave on this particular recording. You see that initially the ABRs have an elevated threshold and are very steeply rising, a bit like what you recruitment you might say, and that's because the outer hair cells are not working. But even after the outer hair cells are working again, the amplitude growth remains diminished, right? So what is happening there? Well, what is happening is that there are reduced numbers of ribbon synapses at the base of the inner hair cells. And so what we're looking at here, this is an inner hair cell looked at by confocal microscopy in the mouse. And what you're interested in is a number of red dots. So these are really showing the presynaptic part of that synapse. It's the ribbon synapse. And this is one day post exposure. And there's just a lot less of these dots, isn't there? Right? And that's the basic pathology, that you lose both the pre and the postsynaptic parts of that synapse, and you lose it permanently after about 100 decibels noise exposure for two hours. In one way, that's really incredibly scary. It means that one rock concert, if the same thing happens in humans, will do it. It's not a very comforting thought, really, is it? Um, so that's where the action is, OK? Uh, so this is just quantifying those results again, and these are ribbon synapse counts to show you that what I was talking about is kind of real and that uh, it's not um, kind of just a pretty picture. But why are the thresholds not affected is a good question, but it is actually understood. What we're looking at now is one inner hair cell and we talk about there being a modiola side of the hair cell and there being um, a pillar side of the hair cell. So I better explain what those things are. This is what we call a pillar cell and because it looks like a pillar. It's basically what holds up your organ of corti. This is the pillar side of the inner hair cell, and this is the modiola side, which is the modiolus is the name of the auditory nerve in the middle of the cochlea, right? It's in, the nerve is up the middle of this spiral. So just bear that in mind, because what we have here is we have on the pillar side, the auditory neurons tend to have high spontaneous rates and low thresholds, right? And on the modiola side, you have a predom uh, predominance of auditory neurons that have low spontaneous rates, but high thresholds. 
And when you have this kind of noise exposure, you lose those. So you've still got your low threshold neurons present. And that's why your thresholds don't go up. But you've lost your high threshold, low spontaneous rate fibres that give you this extended dynamic range that auditory neurons typically, or the, the auditory nerve typically has. So that's why it happens. Also to bear in mind is that there's probably what I've called, and it's not a medical term, I just made up, a, a, a penumbra effect. And what I mean by that is if you can think of the total solar eclipse being the, uh, or the total eclipse being the part where there's hidden hearing, of permanent hearing loss, like classical noise exposure, in the areas surrounding that, you're likely getting this pathology going on. So your thresholds may not be affected, but your function of the cochlear in those parts is likely also to be affected. And it's kind of interesting that this phenomenon is increasingly being recognised in other cochlear pathologies as well. It seems not to be isolated to noise exposure. And it's quite interesting to note that one of the things that, one of the hallmarks of ageing seems to be a loss of neural connection to hair cells. So it's starting to be thought that similar mechanisms may actually be quite commonplace in the ageing human ear. So I mean, I think what we've been talking about thus far is going to turn out to be the earliest type of injury of the ear to many types of trauma, right? just a magnitude less injury than what we've classically thought about with loss of hair cells. So, what are the perceptual effects likely to be of this? Well, it's pretty well established, universally thought, that this would lose, mean to a loss of clarity to supra-threshold sounds. In other words, not I mean, talking, you know, conversations, particularly in the presence of background noise, which is something that some people in the audience are thinking might apply to them, I would say, dare say. But this is probably going to be the hallmark perceptually of this phenomenon. So it's hidden hearing loss again, and not only your thresholds, you can go to the audiologist, they can measure your thresholds, they never measure speech and noise, which I think is a big mistake. And then you'll say, but I still can't hear properly, right? I'm still struggling to hear in the presence of background noise. And we're starting to understand perhaps why some people may have that complaint. I'm sure you've all seen them ad nauseum. And potentially, it's, there's one of the theories of tinnitus now is that tinnitus occurs in ears that have gone through a similar process that where there are deafferented inner hair cells and there are neurons that are basically just sitting there um, and that sets up the paradigm for tinnitus. Okay. So how much noise exposure are we talking about in experimental animals to cause this kind of effect? Well, there are a couple of experiments. Um, we in Melbourne can generate hidden hearing loss in guinea pigs with a 95 to 100 decibels noise for two hours. That's in a four to eight kilohertz band pass filtered noise. <coughs> um, Lieberman and Kajawa have, and Lieb uh, Charlie Lieberman is the person that's been leading this in the US. They use 100 decibels in a mouse, um, again, filtered noise for two hours. <coughs> it's not really all that much. I mean, how does that compare to uh, industrial measures? Well, here's some ranges and estimates of noise exposure, and um, it's basically uh, we're kicking around here for an hour or two, right? Again. It's, um, most of the things on this chart are kind of in range. And I don't want to dwell on this because you're the experts in the room, but as you 
would, I'm sure, be, uh, know much better than me. The idea of 85 decibels for eight hours is kind of like the gold standard, but then there's this kind of 3 dB halving rule, which is what I call it. I'm not sure what you call it. But look, you know, when we get up to our 100 decibels, you say 15 minutes is safe. So this probably is occurring outside the safe levels. But I'm sure you'll all be well aware that um, there are many situations, particularly less controlled environments, that people put themselves in on a regular basis. And it sounds like it's harping back to territory that's been covered by doctors for years, but rock concerts and clubs um, and people that work in those environments particularly are at risk, right? Um, because it's this kind of continuous exposure for a couple of hours. Uh, and often much worse than that, right? So that's the kind of hearing loss we're talking about that we think is likely to lead to hidden hearing loss. So what are the conclusions on this part? That the noise levels are considered to be in your at-risk range, but the real salt in the wound is that it's a single exposure required. Okay, and that it's permanent. So how could you detect this in a human being? Well, the gold standard, one would think from the uh, animal experiments, would be by physiology. And you'd think that the gold standard would be to look at the amplitude growth of the auditory nerve response to an acoustic stimulus. But you could also infer its presence by doing tests that have really been in the realm thus far of auditory processing disorders like speech and noise. I mean, speech and noise is the classic auditory processing disorder kind of test. I mean, there are many, many more of them. but. The interesting thing from my point of view is that if hidden hearing loss occurs, which is actually a peripheral event, then of course it will affect processing, but it's not a problem with the processing, it's a problem with the primary input in this type of paradigm. And what I do expect is that there's going to be a lot of confusion and arguing if this ever becomes recognised as a clinical entity between lawyers about whether this is auditory processing or whether this is actually hidden hearing loss. Because it may be difficult unless we can get some reliable um, objective testing up to differentiate between them to some extent. That's my kind of guess. So um, auditory brain stem responses a well-recorded one can re pick your N1, or that comes from the auditory nerve. That's what you'd be looking for. These tests, though, are very difficult to do. I don't know if any of you have ever done auditory brain stem responses. Um, you need a lot of time, patience. You need to give several thousand iterations to get decent quality recordings. It's not particularly practical, I think it's fair to say. There is another paradigm, which is the electrocochleography, which is where here we have a transient acoustic stimulus, here a click, and we have a reduction, or we have an N1, which is again the compound action potential from the auditory nerve. That's much more readily uh, obtainable, but you've either got to put an electrode on the eardrum, or you've got to stick a needle through the eardrum onto the inner ear, and there's not too many people around that do that. Now, I mean, it's actually a quick test, admittedly. I mean, the potentials are so big that you can get good, robust responses in a matter of, you know, four, five or six iterations. And if you really want to be sure, do it 100 times over a couple of seconds. So it's possible that that, if it, one really needed to know, might turn out to be conceivable as a paradigm. But I think it's fair to say that these tests are not readily translatable to your wide general population for testing. So I think we're a little way off yet having objective tests looking at the amplitude growth of N1 or the auditory nerve response 
in the but people are trying okay it's being looked at and is there any evidence for this from objective testing in laboratories well not yet however very interesting to note that there is in tinnitus in tinnitus a reduced N1 amplitude is associated with tinnitus, which is exactly what people would have predicted from hidden hearing loss, right? So that's tangential, admittedly, but it's quite an intriguing observation. Now, is there any evidence from human perception of hidden hearing loss? Well, there is one paper that comes pretty close that I found, and this is in the rapidly emerging field. What this paper did uh, by HOPE was that they looked for uh, at people in the Air Force. They compared ground crews, ground staff, uh, people who worked in the office, to people that were involved in air crews who had normal audiometry, and what they found was that the air crews had degraded speech and noise, which is precisely what would have been predicted from hidden hearing loss. So there's not a stack of perceptual evidence at this stage, but this kind of paper does make you think that even when people are using hearing protection, that there may be, this kind of thing might be going on. Because if you think about it, if you're working in an environment that's 120 or 30 decibels, your attenuation from your hearing protection is still going to leave you in the zone, is it not? Right? So, in terms of diagnosis as a summary, Definitive diagnosis from a physiological basis, one would expect you need to be able to measure the amplitude growth over increasing levels of signal intensity of the auditory nerve, which would be either electrocochleography or rigid brainstem response. Not easy to do. But it could be inferred from tests like speech and noise and, uh, and what uh, the conferences I go to, that seems to be the most robust thus far, but then we're in this whole murky realm of is it auditory processing or is it not? And um, that could be a source of some contention in the future. Okay. So, I mean, what would I say as a hearing professional who spends all my time and life treating hearing and um, or thinking about it? what would I say, who would I say might be at risk? Well, a temporary threshold shift after noise exposure is going to be a pretty bad start, right? Because that kind of occurs at the levels we're talking about. Tinnitus after noise exposure would also be a, a, a warning sign. And this kind of thing is more likely to happen, as I've said before, at something like a rock concert or something where there's constant exposure or the Grand Prix for a couple of hours, and possibly not from impulse noise, right? Uh, impulse noise tends to kind of blast the cochlea rather than cause this lower level of continuous injury that we seem to be talking about with um, hidden hearing loss, or at least that's my best professional judgment at this particular point in time. So how about therapeutic possibilities? Are there any? Well, potentially neurotrophins. The main one being considered is NT3, neurotrophin 3. Now neurotrophin 3 is the main neurotrophin in the adult cochlea. The brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, certainly has a significant role in development and is present um, throughout the cochlea and the vestibular system in development. But in the uh, mature ear, NT3 is the main player, and it's produced by the hair cells and also by the supporting cells. Um, NT3 not only provides trophic support to the to survival signals for the cells, but it also, interestingly, is the neurotrophin within the ear that will stimulate the re, uh, regrowth of injured dendrites best. So if you have a deafferentation of the auditory nerve or you lose, for example, your sensory cells 
and you give an animal neurotropin-3, it'll be the NT3 that actually is the one that is most effective at getting dendritic resprouting, okay? Which might be relevant to this kind of story. And here's an example of that in an experimental paradigm from Alan Ryan, a, a colleague in, of mine in the US. And he's basically got uh, here a spiral ganglion with uh, isolated in culture. And he's got NT3 flowing down this channel and BDNF here. And NT3 is the one that the neurons will follow. OK, so that again is interesting. Now, this slide alludes to the type of stuff that was in your uh, New England Journal paper. So I want to take you through the data here so we get some idea about what this has shown. Okay. So the idea is that Wan took a, he took a gene that expressed NT3 and then he had a promoter that specifically targeted cochlear supporting cells. And the supporting cells sit just beneath the hair cells, right? They're right in the vicinity. They're right near those neurons. And they could turn that on with tamoxifen, with a Cree. And what they've done, what we're looking at here is the effect of the null transcript, where there's no actually neurotrophin, no NT3 being produced. And um, then, I can't read this from here. You mustn't have a hope of reading it. Um, we're looking at the synaptic puncta and the ribbon synapses. Now, the synaptic puncta are basically the postsynaptic elements. These are the presynaptic elements, OK? The ribbon synapses are the presynaptic bits. And the interesting thing to note is that in the animals that didn't have active neurotrophin-3, the number of puncta went down after the noise injury and stayed down. But in the animals where NT3 was being produced, it went down after the injury but came back again in the, the postsynaptic um, uh, part of the synapse. And what happened was that you basically seem to have a protection in the NT3 producing animals of the ribbon synapses, okay? Now, this isn't the same as what you could do in a human. These cells are overexpressing NT3, right? So, in a sense, it's not a protective strategy because the NT3 is already there, already being overexpressed. But what it does suggest is that the NT3, when present after an injury, could regenerate the synapses. That's what it suggests. So could we conceive of NT3 entering the inner ear relatively easily? Well, yes. In fact, this is work from um, my group with collaborator Rachel Richardson, where we're looking at NT3 inside a guinea pig cochlea. And this was basically put on the round window. And this is an autoradiographic signal. And you can basically see that there is signal throughout the cochlea by placing this on the round window. Now, and there's also a physiological effect from that with uh, a general surgeon who was uh, at the time Phanish Nushi about at the, at the same time. What we're showing here is that these animals are uh, spiral ganglion cell counts, in other words, how many neurons are surviving. And when we put NT3 in a bead, a slow release bead on the round window, we had a greater survival of NT3. So for those of you that aren't uh, ear surgeons, you may or may not be aware that it's commonplace for us to inject drugs through the round window and for them to be absorbed into the inner ear. But what these experiments show is that NT3 can do it, right? So we typically will inject through the eardrum for gentamicin, for example. We'll give gentamicin in people that have uncontrolled Meniere's disease because it turns off the Meniere's disease. It 
preferentially enters the vestibular system and actually damages the vestibular system, but that actually stops the attacks. It is one of the therapies that's tried after everything, after oral therapy has failed uh, for, with steroids to treat sudden sensory neural hearing loss, is to actually inject it through the tympanic membrane. Um, our group's done work that's shown that you can get drug into the inner ear via both the stapes and also the round window. That's actually very new knowledge in the last two or three years. So we may, with something like NT3, not just inject it through the tympanic membrane, and it's got too many, um, yeah, it's too, too active a, a substance to put indiscriminately in the inner ear. But there's no reason at all why it couldn't be a simple outpatient uh, therapy to have probably a self-setting gel, which is the way it's moving in the field, that we target into the region of the round window and the oval window. And that could be done easily. Just anaesthetize the drum, stick it in the right place, inject, and you're done. So the prospect of putting neurotrophies into the inner ear is not at all unreasonable. From, it's very practical from a clinical point of view. And do we know whether neurotrophins are damaging to the inner ear? Well, in fact, a couple of years ago, we published a paper and from our group again, this time with David Sly, where we were interested in whether neurotrophins had an effect on normal hearing. We were interested because we were thinking of the times we might use them with cochlear implants. What we're looking at here is the auditory brainstem responses over a pre-treatment and then we're actually pumping, this time I must admit we are pumping it into the inner ear by a little cannula. Immediately after the treatment, one week and four weeks, the blue is control receiving um, uh, saline or ringers solution. But the BDNF animals, actually, this is brain-derived neurotrophy factor, right? Actually had a reduction in their auditory thresholds, right? And that, again, was a bit unexpected. So all the excitement about neurotrophins and hidden hearing loss is that it seems possible that it could be a treatment for hidden hearing loss if we could identify who was at risk and have appropriate criteria for when um, someone might be at risk and some diagnostic criteria that could be done quickly. We don't know whether it works. We're working on that in Melbourne and it's also being worked on in Harvard and if anyone wants to speak to me after the talk, I don't want to put it on this particular forum. I could tell you how it's going, but I think there's room for encouragement, let's say. So it may be that at the end of the day, we will have a treatment for this if we can pick the right people. I'm sure when you've been listening to me talk though, you'll have realized that picking the right people would be difficult. The therapeutic window was as yet unknown. I, I've heard from Harvard that they think they can get some regeneration of the ribbon synapses with a day delay in treatment. We've certainly been looking at a lot shorter period of time than that. The longer the delay, the better in many ways. And, and what we still then would have to work out is whether it's actually acting to protect or as a regenerative strategy for the peripheral dendrites. The likelihood is that it would be regenerative because it seems that with hidden hearing loss, the damage is done at the, is over by the end of the noise exposure, which is actually quite terrifying. So you've lost those ribbon synapses at the end of the noise exposure and it doesn't keep developing over long periods of time. So I hope you've enjoyed the foray from basic science and the, th how the way things have been changing here and um, I think it's kind of an interesting and intriguing area that I trust you will be active in um, being mindful of in, uh, in your professional work and I hope we can work together to get some answers to some of these questions. Thanks very much. Uh, well, that was terrific uh, food for thought. Thanks very much, Stephen. That's great. Um, so does that mean that in future workers put their muffs on and take NT3 nasal drops <laughs> when they go to work?
Well, in, in, neurotrophins have not been gone well, basically, when given systemically in the past. Oh, uh, no. It's been tried and it tends to cause all kinds of complications. <laughs> okay, questions please. Um, and we're into the mic if you would please. Michael's got a mic over here, thanks. Thank you. You, you mentioned that 100 dB was chosen for the animal studies. Has any work been done at, say, the 85 dBA level for perhaps a longer period? Because from an occupational perspective, that would be very interesting and would very much challenge the, the current exposure levels we've got. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. I, I mean, I guess I just, if, you look at the, the, if you look at the 3 dB halving rule, then if that's in any way legitimate, then you rapidly find that you're already in that zone. But, I mean, it's a, it's a great idea. I mean, I, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this talk. It would be a good experiment to try. I mean, I mean you know, the, the, the 85 DBA is, is a lifetime exposure yeah. situation. Um, you don't talk about short-term exposure limits for noise mm. uh, as such, but this would generate that idea. And if it could be shown, in fact, that uh, even at 85 dBA, this sort of damage was occurring for a longer period of exposure, mm. it would challenge both the uh, current uh, exposure standard and mm. would also um, put a greater onus on, on the hearing protection that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yes, I mean, it's a, an intriguing prospect. Other questions, please? Over here, uh, Kevin, thanks. My question's along the same lines. Um, the experiment that was undertaken to um, produce the um, deficit was 100 decibels two hours mm. in one continuous exposure. Mm. Um, we know from you know, uh, traditionally that um, noise induced hearing loss can occur with cumulative exposure at lower uh, lower levels. Yes. Uh, or higher levels, sorry, short mm -hmm. periods yes, of high yes, levels. Yes. Have you thought of doing that experiment instead of well, two hour sort of short bursts? Uh, th there was an inference that because the damage is done by the mm. end of two hours, you need less than two hours to, to, to do damage. Yeah. If, so if you yeah. think about it log logically, it would, uh, I'm not sure what the minimum period is, but mm. the damage is complete at the end of two hours. So yes. that's already damaging. So you're right, I think, in alluding to the fact that we really, in terms of looking at how this should be uh, sort of thinking put into of context. Like a dose-response relationship. Yes. Mm. Mm. It's not so easy to do these experiments. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it takes time, <laughs> and those ribbon synapses take hours of work. But it seems quite an important thing to consider. Well, considering the um, the ubiquitousness of this particular problem, and what we're talking about is the traditional noise noise induced hearing loss that we see on audiograms. Yes. <laughs> when you're talking about this, it's it's a much bigger problem. Indeed, yes. Peter Clark. Well, I, I'd like to be a bit contrarian for a change and say <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's a problem or not because uh, if you look at a modern community that's being exposed to very high noise levels for periods of two hours in rock concerts, mm. as you pointed out, in fact, uh, it's only people of my age and maybe a small distribution around it that haven't had that sort of exposure. Mm. So you're talking about the whole community, mm. not just a few people. And at the end of the day, I wonder whether it's a real problem in clinical terms. I can see how descriptively it's interesting and real, yeah, but in practical terms for the community as a whole, maybe the extent of the noise exposure, particularly for the last 20 or 30 years, is such that everybody's got this problem. It might be, it might be normal. Uh, but it, yeah, was, well, it wouldn't necessarily mean it was a good thing. And, and I, I must say, look, it is a very reasonable thing to ask. 
I mean, uh, I've wondered the same things myself. As this is such a rapidly emerging field, the clinical significance of the individual is yet to be ascertained. I mean, the kinds of differences that were seen amongst the air crews was, I think, about a three decibel change in speech and noise discrimination, which, I mean, means something. You know, that's twice as bad, basically, right? Now, it's not to say that bravado can't get you through, right? <laughs> um, all the same. And if all your mates are the same, well, perhaps it's um, not such an issue. I mean, or it may not seem an issue at the time, but um, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, how does it translate to the fact where everyone's been exposed, or many, many people have? I, we don't yet have the tools to make the assessments, I think it's fair to say. A, a quick question around the improved speech discrimination, which I gather is, is a real possibility with the, growth, with the neurothropin-3 growth factors. Mm. But how about the other factors, for example, the hypercusis, the tinnitus, would this be able to sort of, I'm not trying to get a three in one hit here, but speech discrimination being one aspect, but it can also be a particular nuisance to have constant tinnitus as well as the hypercusis, which actually hurts. Yes. So would this be able to assist with that as well, perhaps? Well, if you uh, ascribe to the idea that one, many the tinnitus can arise from deafferentation of the auditory nerve, it would seem likely. But of course, I think there are many other factors that can lead to hyperacusis and then tinnitus in the uh, industrial setting. I mean, I see it with people that have had single episodes of um, noise screaming through a headphone and then there's an autonomic kind of aversion and then it descends into that, spirals downwards into hyperacusis and tinnitus. So I don't think that kind of situation would be remediated by neurotrophins because I don't think as far as I can gather, that short, sharp, adversive stimuli are likely to do it. But there may be other types of tinnitus like that um, would be amenable to it. Does that answer your question clearly enough? It's good, okay. But Ian? I, I just wondered how certain it is that this um, loss of the mirror neuron or mirror synapses is permanent given the number of other areas of brain injury where there are um, synaptic loss after concussions and so on which then re-establish over a period of weeks or months and, and whether there's any um, relationship between what's going on here and what happens in idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss where you do have a tendency towards um, spontaneous recovery but over not over days over weeks and months mm, yeah interesting questions I mean the, um, the situation with noise is well understood it's been studied for years and years really the idea that you can get spontaneous regeneration of auditory neurons in a purely excitotoxic injury of the inner ear is, has been known for years and years the intriguing thing is why it doesn't happen with noise and, and the, the kind of the hypothesis is that the hair cells themselves are injured to some extent. They still may be able to transduce but there's something not quite right about them. Um, so as best we can ascertain um, that is seems unlikely that these do recover after noise exposure. Um, that really slow recovery of uh, hearing loss after sudden sensory neural hearing loss has intrigued me for a very long time. I don't understand what happens with that. Um, I would be speculating wildly. <laughs> but I doubt whether it's synaptic regeneration. <laughs>
There are other things like lateral wall injury and recovery of function of the lateral cochlear wall, particularly relating then to the endocochlear potential um, and regrowth of fibrocyte areas that are injured in the, in the sudden hearing loss that seem to be better candidates for that slow recovery of hearing. But it is a very intriguing phenomenon. Ian, do you want to explore that more? Have you got enough? Yes. Okay then. Other questions, please? Um, Stephen or Wing uh, in Sydney, do you want to ask anything? Gone home. Gone home. Okay. Um, other questions, please? All right. Well, I think we'll probably round it up there and just thank you okay. very, very much. It's for a pleasure. Okay.